Our gospel reading today is from the book that uh, John wrote. John chapter 2, in verses 1 through 11. The story of how Jesus changes water into wine. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, so they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. This, the first of his miraculous signs, Jesus performed in Cana of Galilee. He thus revealed his glory his disciples put their faith in him. This is the gospel of our Lord. During the past week, the Gillette Company attracted quite a lot of attention for an ad that they are running, protesting what they term toxic masculinity. Now that uh, ad has garnered some positive responses, and uh, apparently quite a few negative reactions. Many people felt that the ad implied that masculinity was inherently toxic. I'm not sure how this is going to play out in terms of whether or not it sells razor blades and shaving cream. <laughs> but I... Uh, I do know that not all publicity is good publicity. Some people felt that the ad was implying that men should be more like women. I couldn't help comparing their message, the Gillette message, to the one in Psalm 128, which we read earlier. This psalm, probably written by David, the great shepherd king, describes what I would call healthy masculinity. It describes a God-fearing man who values family and hard work. Blessed or happy are all who fear the Lord, who walk in his way, it says Psalm 128, verse 1. What can make masculinity toxic is leaving God out of the equation. Living life without regard for God and his word. Living life without regard for God is what the Bible calls sin. The only way to be a good man is to be God's man. Now we understand that every human being who was ever born was created in the image of God. The Bible says that God created humankind in his own image. In his own image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So every person, every person is like God in some way. Women and men are both created in the image of God. And by divine design, there are differences between the sexes that go much deeper than physiology. It's not just our plumbing that's different. What our society needs desperately 
is not for men to be more like women, but for men and women too to be more like Jesus. Jesus is our example. In John chapter 2, we find Jesus at a wedding in Cana in Galilee, not far from Nazareth where he grew up. Now interestingly, Jesus and his disciples were invited to this wedding, and I have observed that there is no place in the Bible where it is ever recorded that Jesus turned down an invitation to a party, a celebration, or even an invite for dinner. If you ever find a thing like that, you come and show me, because I haven't seen it. Jesus loved to go where people were. He loved to be with people. The scene here is a wedding in a village and the feast that accompanies that happy time. It was a happy time in which Jesus gladly shared. But something went wrong. Perhaps there were more guests than had been anticipated, and they ran out of wine. Now, for a Jewish celebration, wine was considered to be an essential. Without wine, said the rabbis, there is no joy. It was not that people got drunk. In fact, drunkenness was a great disgrace. But hospitality was considered to be a sacred duty. And for provisions to fail at a wedding feast, would have been a great humiliation for the bride and the groom. It would have been an ongoing source of embarrassment that would have become the talk of the town. Now Mary, the mother of Jesus, becomes aware of the situation. And so she comes to tell Jesus about it. I'm sure that she did this quietly. She didn't want to cause distress to the bride or the groom or their families. She said, according to John chapter 2, verse 3, they have no more wine. And Jesus, according to verse 4, responds respectfully. Dear woman, why are you involving me? The very fact that Mary came to Jesus about the problem shows us something about his character. At this time, Jesus was just getting ready to start his public ministry. Up to this time, Jesus had never performed a miracle. It tells us at the end of this story that this was the first of his miraculous signs. So Mary probably was not even aware that Jesus had the power to perform miracles, or at least she'd never seen it happen yet. And yet she went to him. She went to Jesus with the problem. John 2.11 tells us that it was his first miracle, and yet Mary was confident that Jesus would know what to do. Joseph is not on the scene here. In all probability, he had passed away by this time. But obviously, as Jesus was growing up, as a young man, he had proven himself to be reliable. He had proven that he had good judgment, that he had a loving, caring spirit. He would know the best way to handle a difficult situation. Jesus exhibited masculinity at its finest. Those who knew him best trusted his character. Men respected him and were drawn to follow him. Women loved him and knew that they were safe in his company, that they were valued and appreciated. Children loved to climb on his lap and be held in his arms to receive his blessing. Isn't it interesting that it was in a small town in Galilee, at the wedding of a humble young couple, that Jesus decided the time was right to reveal his miraculous power and his glory. 
The Bible tells us that there were six stone water pots there. Now, the Apostle John, in writing his gospel, never gives us any unimportant information. Every detail that he mentions is significant. He says there were six stone water pots, and they held from 20 to 30 gallons each. So, taking a rough average of 25 gallons per, and six water pots, that works out to 150 gallons of wine. At Jesus' command, those water pots were filled. In fact, it says they were filled to the brim. And then that water, that ordinary water, was miraculously transformed by the power of Jesus into wine. 150 gallons of wine. No wedding party on earth could drink that much. Why so much? I believe that Jesus was making the point that when he gets involved in any situation, in any life, there is a superabundance of what is needed. There's a spiritual lesson here. No human need can exhaust the grace of God in Christ. In him there is found a superabundance of life. Now I know that in some Christian circles, people quibble as to whether this was actually wine or whether it was just unfermented grape juice. The fact is that a reading of the Greek text makes it clear that it was the real thing. That it was indeed wine that Jesus had made. Somebody asked me one time if I ever drank wine. First happened to be a Southern Baptist and they were strongly against it. And my response was, I occasionally drink wine. But I want to be as much like my Lord as possible. So I've even made it once or twice. <laughs> now, there are people who have a conviction against drinking alcohol, and there are people who should not touch it because it causes a problem for them. And if you have a conviction against it, do not leave here today and say, the pastor said it's okay if I drink. I'm not saying that. If God has given you a conviction, you stand by that conviction. But what I am saying is, don't judge people who may have a different conviction. A little clip that Tim played for us at the beginning of the service, for those of you who were reading and following along on the screen up here. There was a message about judging. We are not to judge another man's servant, the Bible says. Especially not God's servant. Let God deal with each person. Now there are things that are clearly taught in Scripture as being right and being wrong. And when we do the things that are wrong, that is what's toxic. That's toxic to masculinity as well as to femininity. We are called to be a holy people, set apart to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. If you want to become the kind of man or woman that you were created to be, it is absolutely essential that you become a committed follower of Jesus Christ. We have a theme here, a motto for our church family. Sometimes we affirm it together. I think it would be good to do that this morning. Friends, brothers, sisters, what are we here for? Loving God, loving people, making disciples. What's a disciple? A disciple is a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Let's try that one more time. What are we here for? Loving God, loving people, 
making disciples. That's why this church exists. That's the call of God for this church. We need to be more and more and more like Jesus. When Jesus gets involved in our lives, that's where we really start to live. Up till then, you're not really living. You're just kind of existing. The Spirit of Jesus will make a change in your life that is like changing water into wine. Perhaps you're here this morning and you have never committed your life to Jesus. You have never asked Him to forgive your sin. You've never invited Him into your life to take control, to be not only your Savior, but your Lord. I'm going to ask right now that everybody here just close your eyes and bow your heads if you would. And if there's anyone who says, I want to make a commitment to Jesus Christ today, just raise your hand. I'd like to pray for you. I won't pray for you by name, but I will recognize you in the prayer and invite you to pray with me. I see a couple of hands raised, another and another. Yes, thank you. And another. Thank you. God bless you. He knows what's going on in your heart. At whatever point you may be spiritually, today is your day to decide that you will be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. Silently where you are, I invite you to join me in this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you so much for loving me. Thank you that you want to forgive me. And you've promised to do that. I confess my sin. I admit all of the wrong things that I have thought, said, and done. Please wipe the slate clean. I know that you can do that. You can do that because you died for me. You shed your blood and paid the price for all the wrong things that I have done. Please send your Holy Spirit into my life. Make me a new person. I choose today to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ. I will live for him within the fellowship of his church. In Jesus' name.